Hi everyone and welcome to the Sanya Faruqi show. I am thrilled to kick start today's live discussion. Joining us today we have with us Sanam Naragi Anderlin. She is the founder and CEO of the international sorry. She is the founder and CEO of the International Civil Society Action Network ICANN. They're heading Women's Alliance for Security Leadership with local women-led peace-building organizations in over 40 countries affected by conflict and violent extremism. Sanam is the advocate, organizer, and among civil society drafters of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security in 2000 and for leadership of resolutions. Sanam established the Innovative Peace Fund, the first independent fund for women's peace-building work. She was awarded an MBP as part of the United Kingdom's Queen's Honor List in 2020 for service to international peace building and women's rights. Sanam, an absolute honor to have you today joining us on the Sanya Faruqi Show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here with you. Likewise. Um, so I'm going to start by discussing the recent event organized by ICANN, which was really amazing. We came in power, we in peace. I watched a couple of sessions and you know, we had an amazing lineup of women as well. Tell us a little, what were the key highlights and themes that so appeared through the Kodo conversation me. with experts from all around the world regarding the current global political and security challenges? Thank you. Um, so first of all, this is the... Uh, we do an annual gathering of the members of the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership, and they're all um, either individuals or people who have formed organizations locally rooted indigenous in, in 40 countries. Um, and we hadn't seen each other in two and a half years. We'd been seeing each other on Zoom. And so it was really wonderful to actually be back in person and be able to um, just hug uh, people. It, it's really hard to explain the energy and the power that comes from a hug of solidarity, especially given the fact that this network is people is made up of people who are working in Colombia and Yemen and on Syria and, and in Afghanistan and in the most difficult places and communities that are affected by conflict and violence, Nigeria, Northern Nigeria, you know, and what we saw over the two years of COVID, we knew it from before, but what we really saw during the COVID period was that the international community disappeared. Everybody was focused on their own countries. Um, the, you know, there was no presence on the ground to provide PPE and, and, and so forth. The WHO told people, wash your hands with soap and water. And our partners in Cameroon and in Somalia and Yemen were saying, we don't have soap, we don't have water. Uh, so they ended up being really the first responders to deal with their community's needs. And because they were already doing peace building work, they were trusted. And so they became the interlocutors in terms of the messaging around masks and so forth. And, and then doing food bags and then dealing with domestic violence. And in the middle of doing all that, we were giving them grants to say, to the extent that we could, that from ICANN saying, do what's, what's needed. And so coming together um, last week, we were asking, so what happened? And for example, my colleague from Yemen said, well, you know, nobody was able to talk about peace, but everybody wanted access to water through the work that we did um, with ICANN support through the She Builds Peace campaign that we've been supporting. They started a dialogue between armed actors and communities around access to water and then uh, mask, you know, the healthcare questions. And, and that's really contributed to what is now has turned into a truce and a, and a sort of grounds up um, peace process. So it was sharing those experiences, sharing the strategies, um, sharing, frankly, the real concerns that everybody has, because we talk about the food insecurity or climate change and the impact or um, rising authoritarianism or rising extremism. My partners are really at the front lines. They're not behind the scenes. They're really at the forefront of seeing, feeling, touching, and then being having the courage and the heart to say, we have to do something about this. So it was really a mixture of the concerns, the opportunities, and then the strategies of what they can do at a local level. Yeah. 
And just to give our viewers a sense of how bad it can get there when it comes to participation and inclusion of women peace builders and critical peace security processes and spaces, spaces, tell us why these discussions rarely include women and why is it important for women peace builders to be especially you know, living through a post-pandemic, ongoing pandemic world and also working towards a post-pandemic world, why is it important for women to be part of the peace process that we are uh, you know, so, so the first part, I answer the first part and then we can get to the second part. So why are they excluded? They're excluded because when you think about war and peace and you think about who sits at the tables of negotiation, you know, going back to the Greeks and the Persians 2,500 years ago, all the way now to now, the perception is that it's the political and military leaders that sit and they decide and they represent their constituencies, right? The issue is that in the last 30 years, since the end of the Cold War, the wars that we see and experience are within countries. And the problem is that, okay, you might have a militia here and an army there and, or a government actor there, um, but they, they are fighting in their own communities. They are, they are victimizing their own civilians. And so that notion of two sides, as if, as if conflict is a football game, is completely um, unreal. It's it's an idealistic way of thinking about it. And what we've what we've seen repeatedly over the last 25 years, and and that's why we got the resolution, um, was that you need people who are actually taking the responsibility to protect their communities, people who are doing the humanitarian work or who are negotiating the end of violence. Um, and very often, this is women. It's local women who, you know, have the, and not all women, but certainly the people that I work with. And so they become the voice and representation and, and the knowledge and expertise of what's happening on the ground. And we think that, that it's absolutely essential that they're there. All the research we've done shows that when women are present, the chances of a peace agreement are increased. The chances of the sustainability of a peace agreement are increased. And they bring in the perspectives and the needs and concerns of people affected and they also look at it from a future standpoint it's not sort of sitting there and saying well you know 100 years ago you know your community did this to me and and now we need to decide and who takes power and you know i take power for me and you take power for you it really is about reframing it as responsibility and caring for those that are affected um and when women are absent sadly um these a lot of these conversations are also absent yeah and giving you an example, in early February 2019, Myanmar peace talks took place in Moscow between the U.S. government and the Taliban. That had advanced the possibility of negotiated so-called peace further than any previous attempt in the 17-year-long conflict. However, women and the agenda on women's rights were largely absent from those peace talks. Do you think Afghanistan is an example of what happens as we are seeing the current state of the country, especially when it comes to issues pertaining to women's rights? What happens when women are not entirely included in peace talks? Is Afghanistan a lesson for the world? And what about Yemen, Syria, and other countries that have lived through conflicts as well? Completely. Afghanistan is really the um, test case and the international community failed systematically across every institution and, and um, structure and system that, that we have. And the, and the simple answer is this, Afghan women, the Afghan women, peace actors, peace builders, those in government, those in the community and civil society sectors, for years, they were warning about what the Taliban represented. For years, they saw it, they knew it, they'd lived it. And if they had been allowed to be present as their own independent delegations, not shoved in having to negotiate with the government and so forth, but as their own voices from the ground up, they would have raised two critical issues. Number one, civilian protection, right? What happened in all the negotiations that happened in Doha and elsewhere, the Taliban continued to attack schools, maternity clinics, universities, public spaces. And meanwhile, they were sitting in the negotiations and, and from the US standpoint, the, the United States, re allowing the release of 5,000 Talibs from jails back into society without saying, okay, what's the condition for that, right? So women number one would have, were raising the question of protection for the civilian population. And the second thing was of course, around the question of the status of women, which is you know 50% of the population and minorities, other minority communities. 
if they had been present throughout, it would have been a different story. And and we know this because in in the subsequent months, since since August of this year, um, any time that, for example, Norway invited Afghan women, and there was a dialogue, one one in, attempted with with the Taliban. We've had a, a EU um, parliamentarian go visit, and we advised, please meet, facilitate a dialogue. Any time they sit and they actually face to face talk to each other, things begin to un. There's more understanding, and there's more framing of common ground and, and, and discourse. If this had happened eight years ago, five years ago, four years ago, two years ago, it would be a very different place now. And the international community, NATO countries, owe the Afghan people. Thousands of Afghan so soldiers, policewomen, policemen were killed in the this war on terror that was supposedly the agenda of the US. And now they've been left behind. You know, we told, you know, the United States, NATO told told Afghan women, go become police officers, go into the army. They were all systematically left behind. Of all these people that they've evacuated, very, very few are actually women principals. I mean, women who, who were at risk. We're, I'm dealing with them. We have we have a list of 2,000 families and, and overwhelmingly it's it's women who are giving public service who've been left behind and excluded. So um, it, it's it's a total travesty and it could have been avoided. Yeah. According to the Council on Foreign Relations between 1992 and 2019, women constituted on average 13% of negotiators, 6% mediators, and 6% of signatories in major peace processes around the world. While there has been some significant progress in women's participation, about seven out of every 10 peace process still do not include women mediators or women signatories. What are the continued, what are the reasons for this continued failure to include women and are we still living in a man's world? So <laughs> we are living in the in not only a man's world, we're living in the in the uh, world where the in, individual egos of men um, prevail. Um, because to be the mediator of a, you know, Yemen process, a Syria process, an Afghanistan is, you know, for many, it's about a ticket possibly to a Nobel Peace Prize um, or some <laughs> other kind of accolade. And um, and it is it is the most exclusive space you can be in, that mediation space. And I've been in there. I was one of the first, I, I was actually the first mediation expert advisor on the UN standby team dealing with gender and inclusion. And you, it's like you go into these hallowed spaces and you think, my goodness, these people really know a lot. And then you realize, no, it's not that they have more knowledge than, than the women on the ground or they have, they have more expertise necessarily. It's just that when you come into those exclusive spaces, they don't necessarily want to open it up and um, shine a light in terms of how things are done or how things are not done. And, and, and in many ways, there's very little accountability for when the senior figures don't uphold and implement the policies of the institutions. We have 10 Security Council resolutions. This should no longer be an issue of, you know, are women peace builders engaged or not? We've given endless recommendations, practical recommendations, and we've practiced them, as, as I said, from within this institution and, and outwards, whether it's the UN or governments, frankly. Um, so, so I think that this this is definitely about um, the exclusive club and, um, and, you know, allowing, sometimes tokenistically, but not really wanting to open it up. It's also that we still think about it in terms of diplomats and government officials, you know, the minister, former minister of such and such. What we're seeing is that the former minister may know some things, but the local people know other things. And so you need the ecosystem. You need both. It's, it's complex issues. And so we're saying, do inclusive processes. You bring the best out of everybody um, based on their strengths. Um, but, uh, but it remains a, an elusive issue because of um, the systemic challenge. Yeah. What can be done to close the gender gap and maximize women's impact in these talks and also to be seen as political agents and not just women who are present in the room talking about how to build you know, peace processes or how to save the uh, communities, but also be seen as powerful influencers, political agents, which most of the time they're not seen, accepted, or even acknowledged as. What can be done to boost this inclusion of conflict prevention resolution by governments and mediators? 
So, so over the years that I've been in this agenda, you know, we started by talking about women as peace actors or peace builders, and then the language became women. But in the last two years, we have, through ICANN and through the WASP network, we've said, look, we need to recognize the first step towards this inclusivity question is to recognize that you have people who have become peace builders. And peace building is a very specific, very difficult, often very dangerous practice and a way of being because it's, it's about recognizing the rights of people, but it's also saying we need to reach out and talk to the other side. We need to reach out and talk to armed actors or people who may have committed violence because to make peace, you have to talk to your enemies, right? So they have, they, there is a particular approach that peacemaker, peace builders, women peace builders make. And so number one, we've said they need to be recognized. Number two, that recognition needs to be translated into inclusion in the design of these processes. And again, the advocacy we've been doing is to say, have them there as independent delegations. You know, don't put them in the political delegation of a government because a government is a political actor. They are, these women are political actors with a small p and they're representing a different constituency. And if they are, if they are there based on the work that they're doing and their expertise and knowledge of what's needed on the ground, and the process is about peace, you would want them there. So if you're, if you're excluding them, it basically means you're threatened by them, right? So, so we're, we're trying to shift the balance and say, have them as independent delegations um, present. And then the third part of all this is that we started the, um, uh, through our network, we started this campaign called She Builds Peace. And really it's about get, providing the resources, you know, stipends and the support and the solidarity to our partners to say, go and, raise awareness in your own societies and your own communities about peace builders and, and peace building work. And that I think is really important because it's, it's a way of challenging a lot of the narrative, which is at the local level, people perceive this to be Western and, and external kind of influence. And they're saying, look, we're, we're very local, we're very indigenous, we're drawing on, on traditions. And similarly, it's challenging the, the outsiders very racist and very sexist perceptions that, oh, if we're thinking about the women of Cameroon or Nigeria or Colombia um, or Afghanistan, for that matter, there are, you know, these poor passive women who need uh, the, you know, us to bestow empowerment on them and, and so forth. Like, no, they are more empowered, more courageous than any of us. We need to recognize and enable and give them the access. And so, so we're looking at it from the top down and from the bottom up. Yeah. And talking about these challenges, um, in 2020, the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights verified 35 claims of human rights defenders, journalists, and trade unionists in seven conflict affected countries where data could be retrieved. This number is said to be an undercount and surpasses the confirmed numbers of film in 2018 and 19. While we discuss the importance of women and inclusion in peace talk and peace process, it often comes with a whole lot of personal safety challenges. Could you share a little about that and what can be done to keep, keep the women safe while they do their jobs? Absolutely. We see, we see a variety of different threats. So one is if, they are if they're entering the space. So for example, if you're in, a, in Yemen or, or in Iraq and you're dealing with, um, or you're trying to challenge militias and others, government forces, et cetera, that are recruiting children, right? and you're saying, no, we need these children to go to school, you're, you're directly perceived as a threat. And those entities will stop at nothing. They will threaten women's lives. They will threaten their families. Um, they will malign them. Uh, women are often um, targeted um, with really like ideas of, you know, oh, they are, they are you know, prom promiscuous and they're prostituting themselves. So there's a whole kind of sexualized attack as well as the physical uh, um, attacks. We launched um, through the campaign, we said protection of peace builders. We did a lot of research. We've come up with very practical guidance on what can be done at a local level by uh, also by embassies on the ground. Um, the United Kingdom took it to the Security Council and pledged support for this protection uh, framework. So we, again, we have the policy language now it's time to put it into practice. And again, on Afghanistan, they failed completely. But we are looking at it from the ground up to say, what are the strategies that people use? What, you know, what can our partners in Cameroon learn from our partners in Colombia? And very often it's about kind of the small things, whether, you know, the safety of your house, how you move around, 
What happens if you're threatened? Where do you go? Who comes to support you? Um, and then, of course, there are moments where it's like they need to be um, given a safe house or they need to be um, sort of help to exit the country, right? And and that's that's also kind of some of the work that, that, that we try and do. But very much it's about, I think, the recognition that we need these bridge builders. And when you have conflict, imagine, you know, you, you, the bridge builders connect. Well, in any war, the first thing that often is blown up is the bridge. And so it's this is the human met version of it, that we need to protect those who have had the courage and, and we need to recognize them. And, and so it's an ongoing um, area of work. I'll just add that with rising extremism, identity-based one, you know, ethno-national religious um, uh, extremism, they are, these movements, whether white right or, you know, jihadis or Hindu nationalists, however you want to call them, misogyny is integral to, to the ideology so that it's always about the co-option and use of women. And so as we see these types of movements and author authoritarian movements rise, the attacks on women and especially women's movements increases because women challenge the ideology, challenge those kinds of highly sort of male supremacy structures. And um, and, and this is one of the reasons why we're seeing uh, an uptick in, in attacks around the world as well. All right, one of my last questions. You worked so much on this subject. What would your comments be as you move forward? Conflict, both internal and external, wars and disruptions are a part of all our lives, no matter where we are. What do we need to keep in mind while we rewrite an almost new world order? I know it sounds like you know, it's the end of the world or the beginning of the new era, whatever we want to call it. If we do manage to survive it all, moving forward, what what is the vision that we need to keep in mind? I think I think it's. Uh, I, I'll give you a few metaphors. Um, number one, we can no longer take peace for granted. You know, for the last 70 years, since the end of World War II, in most countries, we've had this international peace and security architecture. But we've reached a point, largely because of large powers around the world, but we've reached a point where that peace is frayed between nations and within nations. And unless we as citizens um, recognize that we, that peace is the, it's like the, um, canvas, you know, it's like, it's, like, it's, a, it's like a beautiful painting that you want to have, but if the canvas is shredded, the paint falls through, right? So if we don't go back to that canvas and say, we demand from our governments to value the pluralism of our societies, to value the equal rights of men, women, boys, girls, whatever we are, to live in dignity, um, we're, we're in serious trouble. And it's really up to us. That, that That's one thing. The second thing I would say is that war is not inevitable. Every, every bullet that's fired, every bomb that's dropped, it is a human decision. This isn't tsunami, this isn't earthquake, this isn't even climate change. This is entirely in the hands of human beings. And we need to shift the narrative from thinking that human, human beings are, are, you know, by natural, by nature violence, and that war is inevitable and say, no, there are a tiny, tiny percentage of companies and people who benefit from war, benefit from weapon sales, the vast majority of us, businesses, etc., thrive when there is a modicum of peace and security and trust and social cohesion in our societies. And it's time that we democratize and open up this space, that exclusive space of peace and security and say, you guys have failed. It's up, you know, go away. You failed. We no longer want to follow this line. And let's look at who, what the peace builders are saying in the world and support that work and, and make it genuinely a global movement um, for, for, for peace and pluralism is what I would say. All right. On that note, I'm going to say thank you. This was really a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolute honor. And I'm so glad you finally managed to do the live considering all the disasters that could take place this past week have been taking place. So I'm really glad that we uh, finally connected and we had this conversation. And it was truly really lovely seeing you and speaking to you. Thank you so much, and uh, and uh, really, it was a pleasure. And good luck with everything you're doing. And I hope the laptop is okay. <laughs> no, it's not. It's gone. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's how life works from home these days. You know, yeah. this, um, technical disasters have become a part of our ongoing survival methods. But anyway, thank you so much. And thank those of you who tuned in, thank you so much for watching. Moving forward, you. Will be 
doing live discussions. Today was the first live. I hope you watched it. Please do follow us on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, and uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Spotify. I'm going to see you again next week, so stay tuned. Um, more live moving forward. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.